there's a big difference in the way that Caribbean churches sing and uh, in Denmark. <laughs> the churches, uh, the singing is more solemn and regular, and then you go to the Caribbean and they have too much energy, they don't know what to do with it. Uh, all the cultures are different. I watched the baptism one time in Africa, and they had so much energy, they baptized them three or four times. <laughs> and I said, oh, they really like to be baptized there. <laughs> but it, the cultures, God understands all our languages. And I think of the angels. The angels have to speak all the languages in the world, right? Because they have to understand. And, and so they, I, I'm looking forward to heaven. I don't know what language we will speak in heaven, but I have a feeling that many of our languages that God gave us on earth, that he created, and he, we will still be able to have them in heaven as well. Because some music has been composed in English, some in German, some in French, some in Chinese, some in every language, in Danish, and there are native musics in each language. And it, we would lose them if we didn't speak that language. So I have a feeling in heaven the variety that, and the colors and the sizes that God created here on earth will be carried, many of them, the beautiful parts that God created, we'll be able to enjoy them in heaven as well. We'll have to wait and see. We don't know yet. We have to wait and see. Um, the, the subject matter is about survival today. There's a lot of talk about survival. There's a lot of uh, people who are survivalists, and they do what they have to do to survive, and they make plans, and they live, and they buy properties, and they build homes, and they build getaways, and they... Many people, um, at least in America, I don't know here, they have a lot of guns. Uh, they, they prepare for, to survive in the midst of a crisis. But in reality, the greatest guarantee we have is God's protection. We have to be obedient. But Elijah survived during three and a half years. And it wasn't because he made himself a hideaway house. He didn't save water in buckets. God had a place prepared for him. So as he obeyed God and he preached, God said, I have prepared a place for you. And when the water dried up, he prepared another place for Elijah. So God's last day Elijah will also have a place prepared by God. As we, as we open this subject to discuss this very important subject about our survival, eternal survival as well, I ask you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being with us during this last, uh, last night, this morning. And as we continue our beautiful day of worship here on Sabbath, we pray that you will accompany and speak to us. Please teach us fundamental principles, spiritual principles, uh, so that we can learn how to survive. To survive physically and spiritually according to your will. To do what you ask us to do even if it takes everything we have, like Elijah, to trust you and to move forward in obedience is what we ask for today. Circle this house, everybody who is watching, everybody who will watch, with your Holy Spirit's presence and your Holy Angel's protection, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have two brothers, and they are believers of guns. They have many guns and they teach their family members how to use them. And they believe that someday they will need those guns to protect their lives. Uh, I don't have a gun. I don't own one. And I don't believe it's necessary for my protection. Because I've been, I've been assaulted by gangs. I've been beaten. I've been held up by bank robbers. And uh, my angel appeared at my side several times and froze the, froze the gang members, the assailants, and gave me my liberty. So an angel is worth much more than a gun. In fact, when I was in Colombia, having the week of prayer at the university some years ago, Colombia has a lot of problem with, with paramilitary groups and uh, also with guerrillas. And they fight and they kidnap people, and they hold them for ransom. And, and the question is, how to protect yourself in Colombia? Uh, there are some missionary groups that never go to Colombia because it's too dangerous. Colombia is a beautiful country, 
And I can see why there's so much fighting going on because everybody's fighting for a piece of the country. But it's a beautiful country with a beautiful people. I go to Colombia all the time. I'm not scared of Colombia, but as I watch people, I realize that there is a lot of sad things that happen in Colombia. Uh, one of the things that happens in Colombia is people are kidnapped and held for ransom. And if they're not, if the ransom is not paid, usually the loved ones disappear. Or in some cases, they cut them in pieces and they deliver their body in small pieces in a basket. It's very sad, very much pain in Colombia. But they took me while I was in Colombia, they took me to, uh, on, uh, in the car to visit a community. And there was one community that was completely gated and closed in, tall walls. And there was four military soldiers standing up front with machine guns. Now you would say to yourself, this is a safe community to live in. Because it's walled and there's four soldiers with machine guns. Surely it is a safe community. But the week before I got there, something sad happened. Forty, not four, forty armed guerrillas came to that community. Now let me ask you, uh, which, who would win? Forty armed men or four armed men? Who do you think would win? Forty. So the four soldiers laid down their weapons and the 40 guerrillas went in and they kidnapped people from all of the families inside. And so you ask yourself, where can I find safety? You can't. In this world, safety cannot be found by weapons. Safety cannot be found by hiring guards or building walls. No matter how high you build it, you will find that uh, there's only one place in safety. I was crossing a fjord in Norway uh, some years ago, and there was a statue of a man looking up into the mountains, standing by a stake. Evidently, it was a place where many people lost their lives by being burned at the stake. And as he was looking up into the mountains, there was a, um, a verse of the Bible, Psalms 121. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. That is the only place we have security. We are told that if, the, if God does not guard the city, in vain do they guard that guard them. If God does not build a city, in vain do they build. So only what God does, only what God does in protection and in building, if we do it God's way, that's the only things that, that last. Everything else we do is temporary and will pass away. Those who believe that they can protect their lives uh, by finding security with weapons and stockpiling food will eventually lose it all anyway. So we are here to learn the secret of survival. What is the most important thing that I need to have to survive the future? And there's only one thing, an intimate and intimate relationship of dependence with God. They're the only ones who will survive. Even if you lose your life, you will find it. Even if God allows you to lose your life. I received a phone call in Guyana one day, and they said, uh, is this David Gates? I said, yes. And they said, we want you to know that we know you're leaving Guyana on a trip. If you ever come back to Guyana, consider yourself a dead man. I said, I think you're talking to the wrong person. No, 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 no. Aren't you David Gates, the pilot that's always flying around Guyana doing missionary work? Yes. If you ever come back to Guyana, consider yourself dead. I said, no, you are definitely speaking to the wrong person because I'm already dead. What? You can't kill me. I'm already dead. I should have died a long time ago and God has saved my life so many times. I consider myself dead. So you cannot kill me. If God says no, no matter what you do, you cannot do anything to me without God's permission. So I consider myself dead, so you can't do anything to me. Uh, they got confused, and I hung up the phone. Well, after I left Guyana some years later, our next pilot, who was a young, a young man, had finished his nursing, aviation training, aviation 
mechanic. He was born in Kenya, a missionary pilot, a son of a missionary pilot. And he was a tall, blonde young man. And uh, they called him and told him the same thing. You are dead. And, and he said, uh, he said um, I think you're talking to the wrong person. No, no, we're talking to the right person. He said, uh, are you Guyanese? Yes. Well, I'm more African than you are, he said. And he started speaking Swahili. He says, you are of African descent, but you're not really African. I'm really African. I was born in Africa, and I speak three dialects of Africa. And he started speaking in a dialect, and a man got confused and hung up the phone. So it was a different strategy. Whatever your strategy is to survive, there's only one that is successful. The only people that will survive into the future are those that have God as their dependent. Everybody else can do whatever they want to, but the strong men, the rich men, the powerful men and women of the world, they're all going to they're all going to die eternally. So as we look at the future, even if you're burned at the stake, like like the statue showed there in Norway, if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. And so finding our life and keeping our life, how do we do that? It's, 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 we have to make some decisions. Everything in life is about decisions. And last night we, we talked about the ten virgins. We talked about that the church, the church, the ten virgins represent the church, and, and the church today is sleeping. But five of the virgins prepared. They had oil in their lamps. They made preparation process with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to cleanse them of worldliness, to cleanse them of entertainment. Uh, I asked a question one time, uh, can, can you be cleansed of worldliness and you can still, and still watch soap operas? And people said, no, 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 you can't be watching soap operas and be cleansed of worldliness. Well, how can you be watching all the world's movies with all the spiritualism, and all of the filthy language and behavior. No, 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 you can't be doing that. Can you be reading filthy novels? No, no, you can't be doing that. And so we look at all the things. It's not, you're not saved by not watching movies. You're not saved. You're not even saved by keeping the Sabbath. We are saved because of our faith in Jesus Christ. But if you have a dependence and faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if you are grateful for what God has done for you, you will naturally want to follow Jesus wherever he leads you, naturally. So that when Jesus asks you to do something, you will want to do it. Why? Because you are so thankful for what God has done for you. So if we love God, we will try to follow his instructions. In fact, at the last generation, there is a group of people which we call the 144,000, which follow the Lamb everywhere he goes. Should we start following today? Or do we follow only in the future? You see that? That makes a difference. Because if we don't learn how to follow the Lamb today, we're not going to do it in the future either. We have to learn today. So that's what we talked about this morning. Total, total possession by the Holy Spirit allowing us to follow the Lamb. Um, the, the, the protection that we all want can be found in a close relationship of dependence on Jesus Christ. Um, the world today is trying, recognizes there's a storm on the horizon. You can, the world is in, in, in chaos and conflict today. People of all denominations, people of all cultures, people of, of religion or atheism, everybody can see there's a storm about to burst. I want to tell you a story about a lady from Argentina that I had the privilege of meeting and that I talked with frequently. She wasn't just any lady. She was the best friend of the Pope's sister, Pope Francis. She was not just the best friend of Pope Francis' sister. She was their personal finance manager for 30 years. And she wasn't just a personal finance manager for the Pope's family. She was also one of the most influential financial managers for the U.S. Federal Reserve. She, her job was to transfer billions of dollars 
across the planet every day from wealthy families, from governments, from funds. She dealt in billions, which uh, in English, a billion is a thousand million. In Spanish, a billion is a billion, a million million. So when you want to say a billion in Spanish, you say a thousand million. So when we're speaking English, we're talking about a thousand million. So when you're dealing in billions, um, if, you, if you got single bills, and I don't, I don't remember the exact number, but if you got single bills and piled them all together with a, billion do, with a billion of them, you could go all the way to the moon. So that tells you how much money a billion dollars is, or a billion bills, a billion kroner, whatever. If you just stack them up together, you could go to the moon. That's a long ways, isn't it? That's a lot of paper. That's a lot of money. But yet she would transfer billions of dollars. And and a friend of mine who is a banker in Spain, we were talking together, and he said, let me introduce you to Lila. So he introduced me to Lila, and uh, this was the, she was already 70 years old, but she was still working for the Federal Reserve, and she was still helping to manage the Pope's family's money. Well, we got to know each other, and finally she said, I have a question. There are some things I don't understand. And I said, well, I hope it's not about finance because she understands more than I do. No, it's, it's, it's a different question. It's a question that involves what is happening in the world. I don't know how to interpret it. I said, like what? She said, for example, I naturally assumed that the Vatican and the U.S. government and the World Bank and the United Nations I naturally assumed that they are working to help the world, to make it better. But the decisions that are being made are going to cause great suffering on the planet. And the decisions of the Vatican and the decisions of the U.S. Federal Reserve and the World Bank <clears throat> are going to cause great suffering and distress. They are making decisions which will hurt the world and bring everybody into slavery, economic slavery. I don't know how to interpret it because I assume that people were working for the best, but they're making decisions for the worst. How can I interpret it? And we said, we know what you can do. You need to read the book, Great Controversy. That will explain what is happening behind the scenes <clears throat> and why the New World Order and the government is seeking to enslave people in the world today and to bring everybody down to poverty. 20 years ago, in the United States, 10% of the population owned nearly 50% of the resources. Today, 1% own 30 times more than the rest of the 99%. There's been a tremendous shift in, in resources. So now, 1% controls 30 times more money than the other 99%, which means there isn't any middle class hardly anymore. There's only upper, 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 the very rich, super wealthy, and then there is almost the lower class. Very few people in the middle now. And, and so she said, I want to understand what is happening. We gave her the great controversy, she read it in one day. She read it at the airport, waiting for her flight. And she was so interested in that book that she missed her flight. She did not hear them call her flight. She had to go home and come back the next day. But she read it in 24 hours. She read the whole book. And she said, now I understand what is really happening. By the way, we want to any, invite any of you viewers or anybody here today uh, if you want to copy the Great Controversy in any language, you can, you can, uh, you can get it. We will we'll give you a copy. Uh, all you have to do is contact Light Channel and we'll make sure you get a copy. You can find it on the internet. Just type in the Great Controversy and you'll find copies, digital copies on the internet, audiobooks as well as digital PDF copies. But the Great Controversy does reveal what is happening behind the scenes and where the world is going and what the hidden agenda is. It was inspired of God to be able to teach the world how to prepare for the final conflict. 
People of all denominations, people of all belief systems know that there is a storm about to hit. They know that. They can see it. If you're a thinking person. But some of the most blind people on earth are Seventh-day Adventists. Because they voluntarily do not want to know what is about to happen. They deny the things around them. But thinking people everywhere can see that there is a storm about to burst. And so, and so if you are an honest person, if you are a person who wants to know and prepare for the future, you need to read the Great Controversy and you need to, the Bible clearly outlines what the strategies are. Revelation 18, Revelation 14, all of Revelation and Daniel describe the future and prophetically. And Revelation, what does the word Revelation mean? Of course, in, in Danish and in German, uh, it, it, it doesn't, it's not the word Revelation. But, um, but it's an open book. What's a, what, how do you say Revelation in Danish? Okay, what does it mean? It's a revelation, right? It means revelation. Uh, so it, it actually doesn't mean revelation. Okay. Uh, it's an open, open, uh, open barunk. Uh, an, 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 an open book. It, it means, it starts out, this is the revelation of God, which he gave to his angel, the Jesus, Jesus Christ, to reveal to John, who gave it to us. So it's a clear path of, of um, revelation to what was about to happen. Is revelation supposed to be understood? Yes. It's supposed to be understood. Why do we treat it as a closed book? Oh, revelation is hard to understand. But God gave it to us on purpose for us to be able to understand. He wants people to understand what is about to happen. So if we read, if we read uh, the Great Controversy, it's written in modern language for us to understand exactly what is about to happen. I was in Australia. I was in Australia. Uh, I spoke at Avondale College several times. And uh, they took me to visit the place where the Great Controversy was written. It's near, near a river under some very big trees. And Sister White was writing that book. And she could feel um, demonic oppression trying to stop her from writing that book. Because that book uh, reveals what is about to happen. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, recently the South American division uh, released a testimony from a retired Brazilian pastor. And it was, it was produced and sent out to all the churches. And I, I watched it uh, one Sabbath uh, earlier this year. And uh, or we listened to this, his testimony, and it's very interesting. When he was a young man, he went to do coal porter work, which means the selling of religious books. And he went to a monastery, and, and he talked to the priests there, and he said, well, maybe they're interested in reading this book. And so, and so he went to them, and he knocked on the door, and a priest came to the door, and there was a big cathedral there, and, a, and, and the, the priest came and opened the door, and he said, I'm selling some books. I'm wondering if you're interested in buying some books. And so the young man opened up all the books and was showing him. And he goes, oh, this book is interesting. Great controversy. This is an interesting book. I have read all of it. And he went to the shelf and he brought it back and it was fully underlined. The young man was surprised to find a Catholic priest to have read all of, all of the great controversy. He said, in fact, all of us have studied that book. And we believe it's inspired of God. And we believe that someday, when the final crisis comes, we want to stand on God's word and we want to be found faithful. And we will encourage all our church members to stand and keep God's commandments. This was even more surprising to a young Seventh-day Adventist court porter. And he said, so you know, which is, you know the Seventh-day Adventist church is the true church. Oh, no, we don't know that, said the priest. Because Seventh-day Adventists generally don't believe these books. So they can't be the right church. The right church, the true church, believes the great controversy and lives according to the great controversy. And Seventh-day Adventists generally don't believe. So they cannot be the true church. Isn't that an interesting testimony? Question is, do you believe the spirit of prophecy? I know most of you do, but many don't. 
and you cannot be a member of the true church, God's true people, because you have to have the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is a sign of the last day people of God. And most Seventh Adventists today do not believe. And therefore, as a result, they are not members of God's last day people. They may still come to church. They may still have membership. They may still believe everything is okay. But the spirit of prophecy is a sign of God's last day people. The spirit of prophecy was given to us as part of God's revelation for the last days. I was, in, I was speaking to all the seminary students in the Philippines, in Central Philippine uh, Adventist College, and, and uh, all the professors were there, all of the theology students were there, and they asked me a question. They asked a question and they said, uh, Pastor D Gates, uh, you mentioned that the spirit of prophecy is inspired of God, and you mentioned that it is to be treated with the same respect as the Bible. And I said, well, there is, but, 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 the great, but, but the spirit of prophecy is the lesser light. The Bible is the greater light. Sister White said that herself. So how can we consider the spirit of prophecy to be equal to the Bible? I said, well, the same angel that spoke to John the, John the, the revelator, is the same angel that spoke to Sister White. The same Jesus that spoke to, to John, that spoke to the prophets, is the same Jesus that spoke to her too. And I said, the function is different. The function is not to establish doctrine. The function is to prepare us to stand in the last generation, to understand how to prepare physically and mentally for the last final conflict. However, let me ask you a question. I said, which of the prophets claim to be the greater light? Maybe Moses? Does it say anywhere in the Bible that Moses claimed to be the greater light? How about, how about Isaiah or Jeremiah? How about the wisest man in the world? How about King Solomon? Did he claim to be the greater light? No. None of the, none of the prophets, none of the inspired men of the Bible that wrote actually claimed to be the greater light. So what makes the Bible the greater light? It's the accumulation of all the smaller lights. You understand? So when you put all the lesser lights together, you have the greater light. When you put the spirit of prophecy, another lesser light, it goes along with the revelation that God has revealed throughout the ages. But it has a divine function to prepare God's people to stand in the last days. And so, and so the young man said, thank you very much. I, we didn't understand how a lesser light could be as important as a greater light. But it is, because we are told that our life depends on it. Those who reject the testimonies will soon reject the Bible, we are told. And I found this to be true. I have one brother. I have one brother who, who actually studied theology and nursing, and then he later studied medicine at Loma Linda. But his teachers, his professors, taught him to doubt the spirit of prophecy. And his professors taught him to doubt scripture. And when he finished, he decided to doubt and to leave the church. And he became an atheist for many years. Today he goes to an evangelical church. He does not believe in much of the Bible. And he doesn't believe in the spirit of prophecy. So once you start rejecting light, you start rejecting everything. He's still a very fine man. He's a physician, and his patients love him. He's a very kind individual, and we are praying every day for him because I believe God is working with him, and I believe he loves the Lord. But, but the doubts that were created in his mind by his teachers caused him to doubt everything. And that happens a lot in our schools of theology today. Many of our young people graduate doubting more than they believe. So how are they prepared to teach? How are they prepared to create faith? How are they prepared to create obedience when they themselves have doubts? One pastor preached in one of our churches a very nice sermon, a very conservative sermon, and, uh, and one of our members said, thank you very much for that good sermon. It was really, really biblical, 
and it was very good. And he said, well, that's what I preach when I go to conservative churches. I don't preach that in other churches. Oh, so you just preach the sermon according to what the people want to hear. Yes. So if they don't want to hear anything about the Bible, I don't preach it because I don't really believe all of that anyway. But when I come to a small church that wants to hear it, I, I tell them what they want to hear. You understand? This happens a lot. So the question is, how can we possibly be saved if we don't have a knowledge of truth and we ourselves are not following truth? Um, when it, the Protestantism. Protestantism is built on two main pillars. And it's true that Protestantism is mainly dead throughout the world today. But what are those main pillars? One of the main pillars is sola scriptura. Everything you believe must be based on the Bible. You have to defend what you believe on the Bible. And if it's not in the Bible, you shouldn't believe it. At least not as a doctrine. And, and the second principle is no human authority, no pope, no king, no bishop, no pastor, no priest has authority over your conscience. Only God has authority over your conscience. You understand those two main pillars? You report to God for what you believe, and there's no man alive that has authority over your conscience. You report to God. And secondly, everything you believe must be based on biblical Bible teaching. So, though, based on those two principles, many of us today, Protestants, Seventh-day Adventists, Evangelicals, we could truly consider ourselves not to be Protestant. But I want to be. I still am. I would still protest if anybody would want to control the conscience. I would still protest if we want to teach things that are unbiblical. That's why we must continue to be teaching freedom of conscience and biblical principles so that people can understand and interpret and obey God's will as revealed in Scripture. Matthew 25 Matthew 25 is, is the chapter we started last night. It has three parables in Matthew 25. We talked about the ten virgins last night, and I promised that today we would talk about some, some other parables, and we're going to continue. We're going to talk about the number two parable now. Let me review the ten virgins. We learned last night, since we have some new people here today, and maybe, nobody, maybe you don't know what we talked about last night. We talked last night that the ten virgins represent God's remnant people. They claim to be waiting for Jesus' second coming. They claim that Jesus is coming soon, and they're waiting for him. They believe that he's about to come. That's why they're holding their lamps, and that's why they went to the wedding to wait. But there was a delay. Do you remember from last night, if you were here, do you remember why there was a delay? Because Jesus is waiting for his bride to get ready. It's not that the bridegroom wants to delay. He wanted to come a long time ago. But if the bride is not ready, what's the use of coming to the wedding if you're not going to have a bride? Do you understand? The bride is still in love with Mr. World. Correct? Is there the love of the world in the church today? Sometimes the way we dress, sometimes the way we spend our money, sometimes we have entertainment. It's affected. We can tell that Mr. World is still a part of the church. So before Jesus can come for his bride, there has to be a separation between his bride and Mr. World. You can't be in love with Mr. World and be married to Jesus. The church has to be in love with Jesus alone. And so therefore there's a delay and as he delayed, the church fell asleep. We also learned something interesting. And I will tell you some things I didn't tell you last night. We learned that as a church is sleeping because of the delay, that in 2015, the Seventh Avenue Church General Conference voted to take out the word imminent out of our basic fundamental beliefs. The coming, talking about the coming of Jesus. Because we've been preaching this for 150 years. Come on. If Jesus is going to come back imminently, that means at the doors. That means any day. Do we really still believe that? Do you believe Jesus is coming any day now? 
after 150 years? Surely not. That's what the attitude is in the church today. We've been waiting for 150 years. It, surely we've been mistaken. The imminent coming of Jesus, the coming is not imminent. So they take out the word, they voted to take out the word imminent and replace it with the word soon, which could be 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years in the future. It, relatively speaking, it's soon. But maybe not in our generation. So by doing that, basically, we are not Adventists anymore. Because Adventists have always believed that the, is, we are teaching and preaching and preparing the world for Jesus' second coming, which is imminent, even at the doors. But why has there been a delay? There's been a delay because the bride is not ready, not because the bridegroom doesn't want to come. Jesus loves the bride so much. He loves his church so much. There is nothing that Jesus loves more than his church. But if he comes and finds her unprepared, he can't take her with him. You understand that kind of love? You, you can understand the delay, right? If Jesus comes and only finds 10% of the church, in Ellen G. White's time, she said not even 1 in 20. Not even 1 in 20 is ready for Jesus to come. That was in her time. Do you think it's better or worse today? How many of you think it's worse? Definitely the majority. Okay, so if it's not 1 in 20, it's less than 1 in 20, right? Maybe it's not 1 in 100 today. And if you came to pick up your bride and you only had 1% ready, wouldn't you want to wait a little longer to give the bride a little more chance to get ready? That's why what we need to preach today is let the church know more than anything else. The most important thing that has to happen is to wake up and allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a, it's a dual process. The, the forgiveness of sin was done on the cross. The cleansing of all unrighteousness is done in the most holy place. Where is Jesus today? In the most holy place. Many, many of our the theology professors no longer believe in the heavenly sanctuary. They no longer believe Jesus is doing anything at all. They no longer believe that there is a cleansing process. And therefore, the official position of many divisions, many schools of theology, most of the schools of theology, are that it is impossible to have a cleansing process and to overcome sin. We will be sinning until Jesus comes. But I will tell you that if you're sinning when Jesus comes, you are receiving the last plagues. Because Jesus is going to come for a bride that is without spot or wrinkle. Now, how is that possible? How is it possible to not have? How many of us today can say, I have no spot or wrinkle? Can you raise your hand? I won't raise my hand either. We all have spot or wrinkles. So how is it possible for us to get ready? I was in Holland last year, and one lady said, I've been an Adventist all my life. I'm 75 years old, and I finally made up my mind. I can never be ready. What can I do? And I said, you're right. You will never be ready. And I cannot make myself ready because our, our robes are like garments, uh, filthy rags. So who can get us ready? Well, Roman, Romans 5.10. Can you read that with me, please, in Romans 5.10? Romans 5.10 gives us an idea of how that works. Paul, Paul definitely knew how this works. Romans 5.10, it says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we are saved by his life. Here's the secret. When Jesus died, he died to forgive our sins and to reconcile us. What does reconcile mean? If I fight with my wife and I'm not talking to her anymore, we have a problem, right? But if we forgive each other and we start talking to her, each other again, we are now reconciled. That means that we can start talking to God. 
by dying for our sins, Jesus was able to forgive our sins, and now we're on talking terms with God again. I can say, Heavenly Father, thank you for adopting me into the heavenly family. Thank you for allowing me to talk to you and to be your son again. Thank you that I can talk to you every day. That was, that was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. The right for me to talk to my father. I'm not alienated from God. I'm now reconciled with God. Now we're on talking terms. That doesn't mean my character is ready yet. There's still a second part. We are reconciled by his death, but even more so, we are saved by his life. This is the secret of righteousness by faith. Jesus' life is just as important as his death. His life is what allows us to talk to each other. I'm sorry, his death. His life is his white raiment. Do you remember the story of the king who invited all of his subjects to the big banquet of his, the wedding of his son? Do you remember that story? Jesus said that when the king invited everybody, he gave everybody a garment. But one person came to the, to the wedding feast without a garment. He wore his own dirty clothes. And the king said, friend, how is it that you came to the wedding feast with your own garment? But everybody was provided with a garment. And he didn't know what to say. And what did the king say? Cast this servant into outer darkness. Take him out where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is telling us that when we go to the banquet, when we go to heaven, we have to be wearing his garment. We can't, be we can't come with our own life. If, if I came dressed with my... Imagine me standing at the judgment and, and the Lord says, David, what right do you have to be saved? Well, I, I started aviation programs and I started orphanages and I started schools and I, start, and, I, and I started television networks and radio networks and thousands of people have come into the church. What will he say? Depart from me, you doer of iniquity. Because my works are as filthy rags. The only thing I can say is, I accepted the life, the death and the life of Jesus Christ and his perfect life, I'm hidden in Jesus. And so don't look at my life, look at Jesus. And Jesus is standing next to me and says, David has put on the, my white robe, and so Lord, when you look at David, look at me. Now, how is David's life? And he looks at his son and he says, perfect. Never sinned. Me? Never sinned? That's how God will look at us if we are dressed with Jesus' righteousness. Do you understand that wonderful gift? It's not, you can't earn your way to heaven. Nobody can earn their way to heaven because all we can do is receive the free gift. Would you like to have that free gift? It's a beautiful gift. How much does it cost? Nothing. It doesn't cost anything. But, we have to be willing to accept it. If I don't accept it, then I will be coming to the banquet dressed in my filthy robes. But if I accept it, I can come dressed perfectly as if I had never sinned. That's a beautiful gift. And the life of Jesus is what gives us that. Many, many Protestant denominations have been preaching, many Protestant denominations have been preaching that Jesus died for our sins. Is it true or not true? Yes, it's true. Did he die for our sins? Of course he did. Can we, can we uh, accept Jesus' death and have forgiveness of sin? Yes. But that's only half of it. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And does it stop there? No. And to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. So the beautiful, the beautiful... Uh, gift of God is his death to reconcile us and his life to make us perfect in Jesus Christ. Now, we talked about that and that the ten virgins, they need to be dressed in Christ's righteousness before Jesus can come back to receive his own. Now, we're coming right to the end of time. We're almost out of time. Jesus is just about to come. But you say, but the church is not ready. The church is still asleep. Yes, but there is a preparation process going on. All around the world, there are speakers, there are people that are preparing for Jesus' coming. You and I are not ready yet, but we are certainly interested in being ready, aren't we? 
Aren't we here today because we're interested in getting ready? We are here because we believe Jesus is coming and we must be hidden in Jesus Christ. And if we do that, we are getting oil in our lamps. But, but many questions are asked, how do, I, how do I get oil in my lamp? It's not only a preparation process. There is a second parable which tells us a little bit more. Let's look at the second parable. The second parable uh, is about the talents. And it, and it begins on in verse 14 of chapter 25 of Matthew. Matthew 25, 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. Unto one he gave five talents, unto another two, unto another one, to every man according to his abilities. And he took his journey. Now he that received five talents went and invested them and made another five. He that received two talents invested it and made another two talents. The one who made, got one talent he said, oh, my master is hard. If he doesn't get back his money completely, I might lose it. Better, I bury it, and I'll give him back his talent when he gets back. Now, have any of you ever been a church treasurer? Have you been a treasurer of your church? You have? Okay. When you're a church treasurer, you have to show... You have also? You have. Okay. Uh, you have to show where all the money is. But God is a little bit different in his treasury. As long as all the money adds up, everything is okay. When you're a church treasurer or a treasurer for any business or accountant for any business, just have to show what happened to the money. But in God's accounting, it's different. He wants to know what you did with the money, and he holds you accountable for what it could have accomplished. He doesn't give you a talent, and he says, where is the talent when he gets back? He says, what did you do with the talent? And prove to me that you managed it wisely. Now, do you know how much money a talent is? Do you have any idea how much a talent is? It's a 40 years of work. It's equivalent to one lifetime. What, what, is a, what is a standard salary that we might have here in Denmark? How much does an average person might? Just give me a, a number. 300,000 for uh, in, a, in a year. Okay. So 300,000 times 40, 12 million. So one talent is approximately 12 million crowns. That's what somebody would earn, an average person could earn working for 40 years, a lifetime. Do all of us have a lifetime? Even the, the smallest person has a lifetime and you're responsible for using your talents and skills, but some people have more influence than the average. Some people have managed as much as two lifetimes, and some manage as much as five lifetimes. In other words, they reach five times more people, they have greater influence, they have more talents and skills, more responsibilities, and they're responsible for more than somebody who only has one. But the standard is all the same. The standard is, how did you invest your time and your money to accomplish the mission. Now, what is the mission, by the way? Why did the Son of Man come to earth? To seek and to save that which was lost. That's what Jesus said. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the mission. Are, are, are you involved in the mission? Oh, no, I just come to church. Then I do my own thing. I just come to church on Sabbath, and in the rest of the week, I just do what I have to do. Excuse me. We are to join God in the mission. Did you know that you cannot be saved unless you're a missionary? The Spirit of Prophecy, Sister White, tells us only missionaries will be saved. You say, do I have to go to Africa? No, no, no. You can be a missionary at home. What does a missionary do? A missionary is involved in the mission. If you are involved in seeking and saving that which was lost, you're involved in a mission. You're a missionary. And so, at the very end, um, when the Lord comes back, um, I'm, I'm just looking for the verse here. 
I, that in verse 20, no, after verse 19, it says, And after a long time the Lord of the servants cometh and reckoneth with him. He holds accounting. And he that received five says, Here is five that you gave me, and here is five more. And the, in verse 21, the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. What is the joy of the Lord? Souls. Souls is the greatest joy. That, there's great joy in heaven when one soul is saved. Do you know how much one soul is worth? An eternity. Do you know how to measure infinite? Can anybody here tell me how much is infinite? Can anybody, can anybody understand infinite? Can you understand infinite? We can't even understand infinite because everything we know had a beginning and an end. But a soul that is saved is going to last throughout eternity. And there's no way to stop having joy. It just goes on forever and ever and ever. That's why the angels rejoice. One soul is saved. Now, the joy of heaven is to save souls. So what is the mission that says, Welcome thou, a well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. What is that joy? Saving souls. So what does God want you to do with your life? Be a missionary. Use your talents, your skills, your assets, your car, your house, your job, your energy, your health, your influence. Use it to find people, to minister to people, and to save them. That's your mission. That's the only mission we have. You say, but I'm, I'm a carpenter, I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, I'm a dentist, I'm a nurse practitioner, I'm, I'm a dental hygienist, I'm a physical therapist, I'm a farmer, whatever your profession, or I, I'm an engineer, or whatever it is you do, that's only what you do for a profession. That is not your mission. Your mission is given to you by God. The reason you were born is to reflect God's character to others and to help others get to know Jesus Christ. Can you see why many Seventh-day Adventists will be disappointed? Someday to find out that they were not involved in the mission and therefore they are not welcome in heaven. Many Christians are going to find out too late that they were not involved in mission and therefore they have no place in heaven. The good news is that we can all do it, but we have to choose. And the reason we're here today, the reason I'm here with Aunt Becky today and this weekend is to share with you the joy of working for God. There's great joy in working for God. Working for yourself has some satisfaction, but working for God is great joy. You say, I've sacrificed a lot. Well, you haven't sacrificed anything compared to what God sacrificed for you, right? Did God sacrifice for you? He gave his son for you. God would rather live. Jesus said at the cross, basically, I would rather die forever rather than let my brothers and sisters not have a chance to enter heaven. Satan whispered into Jesus' ear, you will never see your father again. It's all in vain. If you die, you will lose everything. And, and we are told that he could not see through the portals of the tomb. He thought at that moment on a cross that maybe he was going to die forever. And he still said, I'm still willing to do it so that my bride can go to heaven. Even if I'm not there. Can you imagine such love? I can't even comprehend such love. That Jesus would rather die forever so that you and I can be in heaven forever. That's, that's a kind of love I cannot understand. I don't even know how to reflect that kind of love. All I can do is say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. And that's what God wants us to do, to be grateful. Uh, here in Denmark, most people have enough to eat, right? Are you worried about lunch? Do you think maybe you're going to go hungry for lunch? In Venezuela, we worked there for seven years. The average person eats one meal a day. And it's not a very big meal. You know how much they make in Venezuela? You know what the salary is? $15 a month. You know what you can buy with $15? Two or three kilos of rice. That is all you can buy with 100% of your salary. 
Can you buy other things? Well, if you had money, you could. Can you buy bread flour? Can you buy oil? Can you buy other things? Well, if you had money, you could. But if you only make $15 a month, you can, everybody, the family working together is enough to eat one meal a day. When, when, when Becky and I were going to Venezuela recently, when we went up to Brazil, we, and, I, and I went there, I, we saw all these tents, tents everywhere by the bus station. Where are all these tents? Those are all the Venezuelan people that have left Venezuela, but they don't have any place to live. They don't have a job. They don't have any way to eat. So they just put up little tents and they stay by the bus station. When I went just a few weeks ago, there wasn't any tents anymore. And they said, well, the government got tired of them all living by here. So they, they made another place where they can stay, but they can't stay by the bus station. They'd rather have them stay in another separate place so that the whole center of the city is not filled with tents. And, uh, but you think, and when, they, when we went to the border, there was, a, there was a, a family going through and the guard was looking through all the bags and he found a piece of cheese. And he said, you can't take this. But that's my food. You can't take it. He wanted to steal it. Well, then they said, in that case, we won't cross the border. And the guard said, too late, I already have your cheese. Everybody's a thief. They're just stealing from from the poor people, and they don't have enough to eat. And so every time I eat a big meal, I wonder how my Venezuelan brethren are doing. Here's another thing. The Amer Indians, the Indians who live out in the country, they have their farms, they're doing better than those who live in the city. Those who live in the city, they even eat the zoo animals. They break into the zoo and they eat the giraffe. They break into the zoo and they eat the horses. They break into the zoo and they eat all the little animals because they're hungry. And so, we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? We don't think of not eating. We have enough food to eat. But you know, the day is coming. The day is coming when those who live in the country will have more food to eat than those who live in the city. If you have food that you raise, even then you can't raise enough. And I still don't know, even though I've planted in our house in Bolivia, I've planted trees and I've planted this and we do everything. I still don't see how we can have enough. But that's God's problem. We're doing everything we can. One, one lady in, in Puerto Rico had a dream of God's last day people. She had a dream and she saw God's people living in the country. And they didn't have enough food either. But every day, everything they planted the day before had already grown up and bore fruit. God can do miracles. You can plant, plant your, potato, your potatoes and your tomatoes one day, and the next day they're already grown and there's tomatoes and potatoes. But God wants you to be obedient. And many of us have little farms, and some of us don't have any farms. Some of us have a few trees. But the day is coming when it'll be very difficult to live in the cities. And, and we need to ask God to prepare us for that day. And He will. He will show us where to live, how to grow, and do other things. But many of us don't listen. Many of us have already made up our mind. We're just going to do what we want to do, and everything is normal. But once the storm breaks, then you find the difference. Then you know those who obeyed and those who didn't obey. I was in Brazil. I was in Brazil meeting with Sao Paulo with our media team. We have a television network called Third Angel, Tercero, Tercero Angel. Um, a third Angel Broadcasting Network. And... Uh, we were meeting with our team there one Sabbath afternoon, and one of, the, one of our workers said, do you mind if I tell you a story? I just had an experience with the Lord, and he said, and my wife also, and we just want to tell you what we dreamed. I said, sure. So I sat down, and he stood up. His name was Marco. And Marco said, I, one night I dreamed I was in a, it was a real, like a real vision or something. It was like real, like I was sitting here today. It wasn't just a dream that goes by. I was standing in a large line of people, and, uh, and, and there were six, five or six people wide, and we were walking forward, and right in front of us, Jesus was standing. And Jesus was looking at us, and as we came forward, he would say, 
left, 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 right, left, 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 right. And I realized I was at the final judgment. Just like what we talked, we'll talk about later about the third parable here. And he said, when, I, when it was my turn, I was hoping he would say right. But he said left. And I had to go to his left. And I was all confused and I was saying, Lord, Lord, what do I do? Uh, he told me to go to the left. I'm lost. And an angel, an angel touched him on the shoulder and said, Marco, you almost had a chance to go to the right. But because of the little details in your life that you know very well that you've ignored, because of the small details, you're lost. And then he started to remember that movie, that theater, that entertainment, that book, that novel, that music. Oh, Lord, if only I had a chance to do it over. If only I could live my life over again. And the angel touched him and said, God has heard your prayer. You're going to be allowed a chance to correct the small things in your life. And he woke up. You can imagine how grateful he was. Oh, I have a chance to put everything in order before it's too late. So he started to clean his, take out those videos, take out that music, clean everything out that belonged to the world. He started to put his house in order. And in a very short time, everything was clean. He and his wife had prayed and it was all done. And then, and then he said, my wife had a, had a dream too. So then she stood up and she said, an angel appeared to me and said, thank you for putting everything in order, but there's one thing you have forgotten. One small detail that you have forgotten. And she said, what is it, Lord? We have done everything we could remember. You live in Sao Paulo. God has told you not to live in the cities. But you're still living in the city. You can work in the city still, but you should not live in the city. That's one detail you have forgotten. You need to put that in order. They immediately put their house on the market. They sold the house. They bought a property in the country. They still work in the city. They still drive in every day. But they live in a country where they have acreage, where they have fruit trees and they have vegetables and they grow their things. And the angel specifically told them, put that in order. So let me ask you, let me ask me, David, is, are you living according to the light that has been shed? I could ask all of you the same thing. Have you followed all of the recommendations the spirit of prophecy has given you? I would say that many of us have small things to put in order still. Don't we? Almost all of us. We have time. What you must do, do quickly. Marco did it with his wife. And they put their house in order. And they also live where they're supposed to live. I just shared that story with you. It's up to you and God to decide how you're going to deal with it. But I wanted to share that story because what, what God did for Marco, he doesn't always do for everybody. But as we share his testimony, we know what we have to do in our life, right? There's some things we have to put in order. So what, it, what is the priority item that we have? The priority item, number one, that we have to do is to be covered by the white robe of righteousness and follow the Lamb everywhere He goes. When He tells us to do something, with God's help, we do it. You might say, but I don't feel like doing it. But we have to surrender our will. Say, Lord, I can't do it. I fail when I try to do that. I cannot be saved by works because my works are like filthy rags. But one thing I can do is I can give you my will. If you will take my will and you will mold it and give me strength to do what you want me to do, then I know we can do it because you will do it in me. It won't be me doing it. It will be you living inside of me. And that's, that's the good news for today. The good news is there's a free robe of white righteousness, Jesus' life, that is offered to us at no cost. We have to accept it and we have to surrender our wills to the control of God. And he will mold us and prepare us. And get, we don't have to fear the future. This is not a sermon of fear. This is a sermon of good news. The good news is there is a way to get ready. The good news is 
God has prepared the way. Jesus has already prepared the way as in, he's in the most holy place right now. At this moment, he's there to apply his white light robe of righteousness to our lives. Would you like to have it? Would you like to have that white robe of righteousness? If we can, if we can desire it and ask Jesus for it, he will give it to us. We just have to ask for it and accept it. And then he will lead us and train us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And someday when that time comes, we'll be ready. When the great crisis comes and the church wakes up like the ten virgins, and we now know Jesus is coming, there's no time to waste, you will have oil in your lamps. I want to have oil in my lamp. So I invite you to pray with me now as we close in prayer, as we kneel down. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for making a way of escape. Thank you for giving us Jesus, his death to forgive our sins and to reconcile us with you, and his life to make us perfect without spot or wrinkle because we are dressed in his righteousness. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. We don't even know how to keep Sabbath. We don't know how to keep a pure mind. We don't know how to perfectly obey you. All these things, we have defects in our lives. But we surrender our wills to you today. And like Marco, we want to put everything in order, all the little details, but only you can do that. So Lord, take our lives, you know you can read it, everybody's hearts. Our decisions today, you can read them. You know them. And we surrender our wills to you. And we ask you to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Because we are weak. But we have the power of choice. And we give you our wills. And we thank you for that beautiful white robe of righteousness. May we be dressed in it. And may we be ready to stand. And as missionaries, may we share that good news with others. So that they too can get ready. We pray and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.